I mean, it might mean asking a board member to leave. It might be replacing an executive for the organization. And those are difficult things for an organization to have to deal with. I'm Rich Frazier. And I'm Russ Fanos. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. We believe strong nonprofits can change the world, and our goal with each episode is to bring you insightful conversations with thought leaders from the nonprofit sector. Let's dive in. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. Today, we're talking about the importance of building and engaging a high-performing board. I'm Rich Frazier. My good friend and co-host, Russ Faniff, is under the weather, so I'm flying solo today. We're talking about high-performing boards of directors for nonprofit organizations, and a good board of directors is essential to the health and success of any nonprofit. They ensure that the organization's mission is being carried out effectively and efficiently. They also provide guidance and oversight to ensure that the nonprofit is operating according to its own policies and procedures. Now, for those of us who have been around nonprofits for a while, we know that board members can contribute to a nonprofit success in several ways, including sharing their experience, raising money, attracting talent, and being ambassadors to its mission. Today, we're gonna be discussing tips for finding good board members and keeping them engaged for the duration of their service. Joining us in this conversation today are Nate Roten and Rick McCartney. Nate, Rick? Could you please introduce yourselves? Tell us a little bit about your experience serving on or working with your nonprofit boards. And before you do that, let me just share with our audience that you are both with the organization One in 10 right here in Phoenix. And One in 10 is a client of IPM Advancement. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I'm Nate Roten, the CEO of One in 10. I've been with the organization for seven and a half years. This is my actually first nonprofit uh, position. I come from a background in the for-profit space but have served on various boards and commissions throughout the years. I find it my distinct honor to be doing this work. Uh, I'm working, doing something that I care so much about at 45 years old. And when I started this seven and a half years ago, my stepdad said, you know, Nate, most people have to retire to do something they really, really are passionate about, and you're getting to do it now. So I find it to be an incredible fortune that I'm doing this work and uh, also work with an incredible board. That's awesome. Thanks, Nate. Rick, how about you? What's your role with One in 10? He is right about working with an incredible board. I am board chair of one in 10. No, just kidding. (laughs) I have been involved with boards for the past 25 years. All have been relative to youth, um, in our case, LGBTQ youth at risk. And I just have been honored to be a part of the community in this way. One in 10 uh, is such an important organization. And we've watched it over the last seven years that I've been on the board. Um, just climb year over year into an amazing organization with its ups and downs. So it's been an incredible experience. Terrific. And thank you. Thank you for your service, Rick. And thanks for the work that One in 10 does. Let's start with finding board members. And I'm just, uh, I'll start with you, Rick. How do you find the right people for the board? You know, I mean, the bottom line is you really have to know who you're looking for and what you are as an organization, certainly. Um, Any organization that doesn't have that sense is obviously going to be a very young organization. And in often cases, that's more of an operating board as compared to a governing board. Both boards are very valuable for organizations. So the organization really has to determine what type of board are they looking for to determine those board members. An operating board is going to be more of a hands-on. A governing board is going to be more strategic thinking and, you know, kind of higher level thinking. Certainly, it doesn't matter how new the organization is, but in finding those board members, you want people to fit into place to really help you, you know, advise and govern or be involved in that operation of the organization. You know, seeking those people out uh, is not always an easy thing to do. There is the whole process of onboarding these people once you find them, but trying to figure out Uh, who those individuals might be that are ideal. You know, one of the best ways we've done that and really looked at that solid board member is somebody certainly that has passion for the organization, but has also demonstrated a great effort in getting involved. 
you know, volunteering, being on a committee within the organization, being connected to one or two of the events or tasks or, you know, needs, asks that the organization has of the community, those people who fall into line to help answer those questions for an organization, sometimes even donors, can be ideal candidates uh, for board membership um, and stewardship. So how proactive do you get in terms of filling board seats and not just with warm bodies, but with bodies that are needed to fill certain roles? So, I mean, how do you identify what characteristics and skill sets you need to fill? Um, I think it's something that you focus on internally, certainly. Um, I'm real big on building that plan. Um, there are great resources that are out there that can help you sort of identify an initial plan, but then share it with the uh, the other people that are on the board currently. Um, it might be a governance committee. Oftentimes, the governance committee is responsible for vetting and and onboarding new board members. So seeking out um, what those attributes might be, we do a commitment letter. So we're very clear um, in writing as we like to do so that everybody really has the same level of communication and understanding of expectations. You know, what the commitment is as a board member, what we expect them to attend, how we expect them to um, really engage um, in meetings, uh, certainly representative of different elements that the organization is sponsoring or producing, sometimes even programming. You know, it's not great to get board members directly involved, I think, with the organization themselves. There are a lot of great professionals that, you know, usually the organization is hiring to run those things. So this is more board centric um, and an ability to strategize, bring their experience from the community, especially as it relates to whatever our mission might be. Uh, is an ideal way to sort of hold accountable these potential candidates. Right. I love the fact that you have a commitment letter so that when somebody joins your board, they know exactly what their responsibilities are. Can you talk about the process for recruitment and what your role is and Nate, what your role is in sort of those conversations? When I, I work with a lot of different boards and, and anytime that the subject of recruitment comes up, there's always this question of, yeah, we know we need to do it, but we don't really know how. How do we codify that process? Sure, thanks, Rich. I, I think one thing to add before we talk about like codifying the process of recruitment is that we also, I think it's important, I've seen this done not, or not, I've seen it done not so well in other boards. And even at one in 10, as we've gone through the life cycles of a nonprofit, I would say there's been moments where we've done it well and moments where we haven't. And that is being really honest with yourselves, your board and your organization about where you are in the life cycles. So for instance, if you're in a really high growth mode, your board makeup may be a little bit different than if you were a very mature organization. And the needs, as well as I would add the risk tolerance to a degree, um, kind of an entrepreneurial spirit, if you will, is going to really factor in. And I've seen where our board has changed at different points in my tenure with the organization. Folks have come on that maybe have a little bit more entrepreneurial spirit, um, less of that, you know, let's control everything and try to make it really super safe. Because if you're in a high growth mode, you can't operate that way. It'll break the wheel. And you'll find that, you know, the board's kind of fighting against themselves. So by really, really being honest about where you are in that, it helps to set the, the tone and also ensure that everyone's on the same page about what this work is going to look like. And so doing that first and then going and really looking at the, the needs of the board, what we currently have in terms of the sectors that board members are coming from, the identities that they bring to the table, all of those things. In our case, we also rank that against our youth data or participant data to see how the board is showing up similarly to the youth that we serve. Do we have holes there? And then that allows us to identify potential candidates. We're really lucky at one in 10 or fortunate that we have a high degree of interest in joining our board of directors. So that allows us to have a little bit more of a process in place to vet those folks and to really ensure every single one of them is great. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I, I want all of them on there, but that's just not possible. But that way we can lean, lean on this tool in our decision-making so that that vetting process happens more organically and ensures at the end of the day that we have a board of directors that's ready and able to handle the work 
of the governing of an organization that is at the place in the life cycles where we are today. And that can be taken to any other organization, regardless of what life cycle uh, stage they're in. One of the things I think I heard you say was that, and I'm paraphrasing, you're looking for boards, board members who are representative of those that you serve. Was that a correct interpretation? That is correct. And I think that's important. I think sometimes boards lose sight of that. Yeah. How do you I would, I would add very quickly, though, sorry, Rich, I would add very quickly that it's not um, just of those that we serve, but the community that within uh, that we serve within. Right. In other words, being very representative of the overall community is really important to us, you know, that we're really connected with what's going on. So we feel like we have some sense of authenticity as we develop our mission. And that's very important when we talk about DEI. And I know one in 10 uses REI for representation versus diversity. It's actually race equity and inclusion for us because we, we really want to prioritize the, the the race piece in this work and, and what we're doing to further those conversations, particularly for our youth of color. Nice. Rick, anything to add to that? Well, having that sense, um, you asked earlier, you know, what is the process of of finding these board members? I mean, the communication between the board, usually directed through the chair, to their one employee, which is the executive director or the CEO in our case of the organization, having um, great communication and an open dialogue to say, hey, I really think this would be a good board member. Hey, I really feel like somebody like this would be valuable for us. You know, Nate comes to me often and to other board members as well to discuss, you know, some of the assets that some of these community members have and how amazing they would be uh, as the board member for the organization. So I think it's, you know, really about all of us as board members trying to find and identify those people within the community that can empower um, the organization, but specifically being very open to that executive director or CEO who has their opinion. I mean, on a daily basis, you know, they're paid to function and run that organization. And any board that feels like that input or that direct authentic communication and honesty and transparency isn't one of the most incredible things or important things that uh, you should have in this dynamic is is going to fail. Yeah, um, it's just been really easy for us to have Nate say, look, you know, I met with this donor or I met with this individual or we're talking about programming with X, Y, Z group at a major, you know, organization elsewhere and and say, hey, this is something that's very valuable for us. We listen and we focus on it and we really look at it. I'm going to ask one more question about recruitment and then I want to move on. Um, and I know that, you know, one in 10 is is celebrating its 30th anniversary and you you have a very successful event. You've got great volunteers. So you've got places where you can look for natural up-and-comers to be on the board of directors. But you both have been around and you've served on other boards of directors. So a lot of organizations face this challenge of, I don't know where to look. I don't know where to find board candidates. How do you address that? How, I mean, where are some of the places you can go to find board board candidates? Nate? I, I love that question. And, and something I was actually going to mention as well that dovetails into this really nicely is looking at your strategic plan. So for us, we're, we're right about to go into our board retreat and launch our brand new strategic plan. And when we're doing that and some of the work that we're doing leading up to it, we're seeing that for us, for instance, we want to potentially go into more direct service around behavioral health work. So looking at your board, and and this could go for any board, uh, looking at your strategic plan and then looking at your board and seeing where you maybe don't have expertise that may be needed in the coming X number of months or years to deliver on that strategic plan. So I think that's a really key place to look first and then as a board or a governing committee or the, um, the, the ED or CEO to then go out into the community, into those spaces where you know there's expertise and leadership in that field or sector. So that way it really narrows it down and you can fine tune it to a point where there's laser precision as opposed to just going out and casting a wide net and then getting all these people that ultimately you then have to say, sorry, we don't need you on the board at this time or what have you after they've gone through the process. I think at all levels, that's true. I mean, when you look at recruitment, um, you know, it really is up to uh, board members as well as that chief leader from the organization 
to be out there in the community and understand who they are and be, you know, communicating. I, I can't believe the number of times I've talked to nonprofit executives who say, you know, I don't know where to find board members. And I can't believe that because as an organization with a strong mission that clearly you as the head of that organization believe in, you know, you really should be talking to everybody and then bringing back that information and identifying as Nate just said, what exactly is really gonna help us evolve as an organization. Hi, this is Curtis Schmidt, producer of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. If you're a nonprofit professional who has questions about your program, or maybe you feel like you've taken your advocacy, fundraising, or membership effort as far as you can and you need some fresh ideas, then we have a special offer for you today. NPFX podcast listeners can get a free 30-minute consultation with IPM Advancement, no strings attached, when you go to ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Just enter a few details and an IPM team member will contact you to follow up. It's that easy. That website again is ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Thanks for listening and we hope to talk to you soon. Now let's return to the episode. Nate, this is your first nonprofit job, but You've served on other boards. Rick, you've been around on boards of directors for a while. I've been in the nonprofit sector for over 30 years. So I've seen some boards uh, that uh, are, are, are just sort of stuck in that dysfunctional mode. And that those dysfunctional boards, they, they tend to run either sort of dramatic disengagement and apathy. People don't show up. You don't get a quorum. There's really nothing that, that gets done. Or... And I think this is really worse. They do show up and there's dramatic conflict and there's just toxicity in the room and you still don't get anything done. Have you seen that? And how do you handle that? I, I have a perfect example of this, of a board that I served on some, I, I guess, maybe 12 or 15 years ago, where I was uh, being vetted to join the board. And the amount of information they gave me was not enough for me to make a really great decision about joining. I knew that after the fact. And what I mean by that is the lack of transparency around perhaps, and this could, again, just generalizing, in this case, it was more about financial performance, but also performance of the executive or the ED CEO. And I think by being transparent about that, you're going to attract talent that's going to help to get in and fix some of the issues because it can actually excite people yeah. to be a part of that as, as difficult as the work can be. And in my case, uh, my, a friend of mine that was serving on the board and I ended up becoming co-chairs of the board really because we wanted to fix these issues that we were blind to during the onboarding process became aware of like a credit line that wasn't being reported on the financials that we didn't realize we even had debt. And then also performance issues with the ED that ultimately meant we had to terminate that individual. So that's that's significant work for a volunteer to do. It is. And, and not being transparent about that from the get-go doesn't equip someone with the, the, the knowledge and can mean that you have board members that either disengage or resign prematurely because this is way more than they were wanting to bite off. Uh, so I think that's really important because every organization has opportunities for improvement. By being honest about those from the get-go, you're going to attract talent that's going to help to work on those issues. And if you hide it, it's just going to backfire. And not making it about you as the individual board member or you as the executive director or CEO of the organization, but making about it about the organization. I say all the time, it's about the good of the child when you're, you know, when you've got the privilege of serving or even being paid to run one of these organizations. I mean, as Nate says, the transparency and really kind of being proactive in knowing what you want as a board member, bringing them on board so that there's that communication. But if you've got dysfunction, I mean, I think anybody that's been on a board that has dealt with any level of dysfunction knows how difficult it is to correct for that. I mean, it really is. I mean, it might mean asking a board member to leave. It might be replacing an executive uh, for the organization. And those are difficult things for an organization to have to deal with. So knowing um, your onboarding process, um, knowing your, you know, as Nate said, kind of trans uh, transparency when it comes to who you are as an organization 
is just going to be, it's so worth it to do that kind of work as you bring these people in. Um, you know, hiding anything is just going to be suicide for these organizations. It's a lot of work. And you're, Nate was right. It's it's volunteers that are on the boards for these nonprofits. And to have that kind of work, I can tell you oftentimes I've been on a couple of boards where leadership is like, you know what, this is not my job to do this full time. This is a lot of work. So you really have to be sure you've got the right leadership. Yeah. And the, and the takeaway here is just being transparent. Let's identify what the issues are and be willing to have those crucial conversations, whether it's a crucial conversation with the executive leadership of the organization or, or the crucial conversation with other board members who might be the problem children in the room. Can we go back to the conversation about representation? Because I'm really curious about your process for finding the board members who are representative of community that you serve within and those that you serve. What Can you talk a little bit more about that and how you find those, uh, those individuals who are representative? Nate? Sure. A great example of this is in our last board recruitment, we identified that we didn't have sufficient representation from the trans community. And we have a significant percentage of youth that we serve at 1 in 10 that identify as trans, non-binary, gender fluid. And so looking at that, again, we're ranking it against participant data and, say, and seeing that we have this whole, uh, we went out and did specific outreach to communities of to trans communities, to organizations serving trans individuals, to um, some of our trans supporters, past trans identified board members. And, and that was definitely helpful. I think though, at the end of the day, you can do all the outreach you want, but you also have to look at, you know, what are the asks of the organization? And particularly as you're looking to uh, invite more folks from various marginalized communities, how have boards of directors historically not been friendly to those identities and alienating to them to the point where they wouldn't even look to serve on them? And it could be about the give get. It could be about the overall makeup of the board. It could be about, you know, different communities tend to work more than one job. And so trying to be on a board that meets in the evenings may be prohibitive. Yeah. Um, so you really have to look at all of those things and even ask potential board members that that ultimately don't end up applying. You know, why is it that you decided to pass on applying for one in 10? What, what is it about our board or our structure or, or what have you that precluded you from doing so? That's a really good insight. Yeah. Rick. I think also a, a, a really strong plan for communicating that. Our governance board uh, or committee really speaks to these issues on a regular basis. We look at a chart of who our board members are um, and make determinations where we might see holes or different um, areas that we're just not very strong. And we really should be as a commitment to honoring the representation of the community and certainly those that we serve. We focus on it consistently. So it's a big part of our governance meetings to, to really analyze where are we in all of this? And um, I think having that strong plan and putting it you know, on the forefront of your mind as a board and as an organization uh, is critical to really actually getting there. And it does take time. It's not like all of a sudden you can identify eight people that can fill all the holes. It, that, that just isn't a valuable process. But what is is discussing it, um, having great communication with the organization as to where they see holes or where their needs they feel are not being met um, from an advisory standpoint, which is really at the end of the day what the board is there for. Um, so I think a really strong process and conscious um, strategic plan when it comes to looking at candidates for a board is critical. Rick, earlier you mentioned the letter of commitment, the letter of commitment when bringing on board members. Can we talk about how you orient new board members and bring them into the institution and bring them up to speed on the culture? Here's what we do, the programming. How do you do that at 1 in 10? It's a very um, conscious process that I will say in the beginning of my tenure anyway, we did not have a very good onboarding process. And we noticed that we didn't because we would start speaking about a program or something that we were up to and new board members wouldn't be totally privy to what it is we were discussing. And how can we get great advice from a board member if they're not completely connected to the organization? So we created a booklet 
Um, now it's electronic where um, all of the information uh, is available. We ask them to go through a two hour orientation. We also create what we call a board buddy, somebody that has experience and has been on the board for a while that they can communicate with that instead of being in a board meeting and saying, wait a minute, I don't understand you're talking about something I don't know, they can contact their board buddy and say, hey, what is it that we are doing here because I'm not sure I'm totally connected and we've got that quick way of getting them up to speed. Um, and I think that has been unbelievably valuable. And to our point earlier about being proactive, that is key. Um, now we can have everyone kind of connected to what it is we're doing on a daily basis and truly advise and you know help us uh, refine various issues or really engage and be a, a great part of the discussion because they are fully informed. And that's important. So I'm a new board member on one in 10. I've signed my letter of commitment. I've gone through this orientation process. How do you keep me engaged? How do you make sure that I know what my job is for the duration of my term, or at least for the next 12 months? and that I'm showing up for board meetings and I'm participating. Well, after they complete their seven-day cruise to the Caribbean. Wow, I really <laughs> want to be on the board now. I'll let Nate answer that. I'm out. <laughs> you know, I, I wish that's what we did. but uh, you know, yeah. and, and I also want to just note that the method for board engagement shifted during the pandemic. And so I think we all as executives in the nonprofit space were just scratching our heads like how do we keep these people involved? Yeah, board, that was a tough one. Meeting at yeah, board meeting attendance was great because everyone could jump on a Zoom, but how are they really getting engaged? So that was difficult. Fortunately, we're kind of mostly through that. Um, and so now we're back to more business as usual. And one of the key pieces here is to ensure that, and, and this is something that I'm just reactivating on doing, is meeting one-on-one -on -one with board members periodically to check in with them and seeing how, how they're doing, what are they passionate about, what is it about one in 10 that keeps them serving on our board and, and keeps them motivated. And then trying to, to take that, uh, what, what I learn in those conversations and provide more opportunities. So an example of that would be if someone is really passionate about our Camp Outdoors program, ensuring that they know when the application opens up for volunteering for that program, if that's something that they would like to do. Um, being on a board of directors that's a governing board doesn't necessarily mean that they're in the nitty gritty and the weeds of the organization. But I think as many experiences as we can offer them that really help to illustrate the impact of our programs is going to be really critical in ensuring that it, they continue to get their cup filled. And we're not constantly draining it by just board meetings. Right. Um, and, and that's all easier said than done. Believe me, I, I am not perfect at it. And it is a lot of work, um, particularly if you have a larger board. But it is a critical piece to ensuring that they feel engaged. And we've put that under the charge of the executive committee of the board. At the end of the day, the board meeting is the board's meeting. It's not just a general meeting of the overall organization where we can come together and just download. Oftentimes that's important, but it is a board meeting. It's an opportunity for these minds to come together and help really benefit the organization. So during our executive committee meeting, which obviously includes the lead of the organization, we have a conversation about what that agenda should look like. I think we've gotten better at it because before we would do that and kind of run through it and have a quick meeting, talk about agenda, for the purposes of getting something on paper. Now we look at it from the standpoint of what really is gonna be beneficial to the organization. What do various members of staff, you know, through Nate as an example, um, really need so that we can ask the right questions or we can download information and then get feedback. And then also we have been lately really including the needs of those individual board me uh, members having them say to us, look, in this next meeting, I'd like to go over this. I'd like to get more information on that. I experienced this issue. I'd like for us to discuss it. We want to be really open to that kind of stuff because at the end of the day, it makes us better. And hopefully, you know, the organization sees great value instead of weight in their board of advisors who can come in. I mean, I own a, a major company, a media company, and I don't have a huge board of advisors. I would love on a monthly basis to be able to go to a group and say, hey, here's what we're doing. You know, how can we do this better? Who has experience and knowledge to help me at the end of the day, in my case, profit more in the, at the end of the day for a nonprofit, um, be more effective when it comes to the mission or raising money, those kinds of things. 
So it's an important thing to keep them engaged. Yeah. And and something that you said really resonated with me is that you're 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 actually getting feedback from the executive committee and board members on what goes into the agenda. And I think that's really important. And Nate, what something that you said was making sure we're filling that cup. And 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 I know from my experience as an executive director and um, as board member and board chair for a couple of different boards in the past, by the way never at the same time. I'm only serving on one nonprofit board at a time. That's a lesson, listeners. Um, so uh, my experience is that any time that we can provide um, for our board members, hey, here's what's happening at, with our programs. Here's what's happening with our with and for our constituents, provide those stories and provide just some educational and background about what's happening in, in the trenches. That is so valuable for board members. It's it's the why. It's why we show up to every board meeting. This has just been a terrific conversation. Thank you so much. We're we're running out of time. I'm sure our listeners have have learned a lot about building and engaging a um, high performing board. It's almost time for us to go. But before we do that, I want to ask you for some takeaways. So if listeners could take away one thing from this episode, something that we've talked about, or even something that hasn't come up yet, what would that be? And I'm going to start with you, Nate. For me, it goes back to the life cycles piece. I think this is so valuable for any executive director or CEO out there is to go through the work to identify what life cycle your organization is in, do that in collaboration with your board, and then understand what that means for your board, for your senior leadership team, for your programming. I, I, we have been very fortunate that we went through a program that was sponsored or, or provided by the Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust called Atlas that did just that. But there's books and tools out there that a nonprofit executive can use to be able to ascertain what life cycle that their organization is in. And in doing so, they'll be able to build a much better board and their the language will be a common language between the board leadership and the leadership of the organization. And I think that is the foundation that everything else builds on. Awesome. I would second that. And then I would add that um, the piece we discussed about really being authentic to the organization, um, that transparency piece, it is not about any individual board member. It is not about any individual staff member. Um, it is about the organization at all. I mean, the entire piece. And so looking at and being a good steward to what it is, you know, whether it's a commitment letter or bylaws, different pieces that can help describe who you need to be as a board member or a job description, which can describe who you need to be as an executive director, um, being authentic to that and really knowing that it is your job to serve to what it is everyone's agreed your job is in this. Nice takeaways, fellas. Hey, where can listeners find out more about you and, and the work that you do? Nate, let's start with you again. Well, our website is oneinten.org. That's spelled out O-N-E, the letter N-T-E-N.org. There's always lots of information on there, as well as our social media channels through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. That's going to be the best. And then sign up for our e-newsletter, which is also available on our website. Nice. Rick? Um, I run In Media Company, which publishes In Business Magazine in the greater Phoenix area um, and soon to be in other cities around the country. Uh, but it's inbusinessphx.com uh, is the website for the publication. And, you know, speaking of being authentic, we just really try to be for and about what's going on business wise here in this community. Thank you. And we appreciate the work that you do as a nonprofit board chair slash president, uh, Rick and Nate, we appreciate the work that one in 10 does in our state. So thank you both. Rick, Nate, thanks for being on the show. We'll have uh, Nate and Rick back in two weeks for a discussion about making board meetings more productive and how that affects governance. And I'm really looking forward to having another conversation with these fellows. Thank you to our producer, Curtis Schmidt, Russ Faniff, we miss you. Remember, all you have to do is call and I'll be there. Yes, I will. To you, our listeners, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. That concludes this episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. Thanks to our panel for sharing their insights and expertise. If you'd like to learn more about our panel members or any of the organizations or resources featured in this episode, we will include links in the show notes. If you like this podcast, we would love your help spreading the word. 
first, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app, so you always know when a new episode is released. Second, forward the episodes you like to friends and colleagues, or share them on social media. Word of mouth is one of the best ways you can help us reach more nonprofit professionals like yourself. And if you use Apple Podcasts or Audible, please leave us a review. Positive reviews are how many listeners decide whether or not to try out a new podcast. We appreciate your help. For suggestions on topics, guests, or nonprofit organizations you'd like to hear on the podcast, send an email with the subject heading NPFX suggestion to contact at ipmadvancement.com. For back episodes and more resources like white papers, infographics, and blog articles, please visit the free IPM Advancement nonprofit resource library at ipmadvancement.com forward slash resources. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.